Yeah.
some time to pray together. On that Pentecost day, some 2,000 years ago, the followers of Jesus were all together and they were praying. And as they were praying, the Holy Spirit came upon them, gave them power to be God's witnesses. And so it seems quite fitting for us to take the moment to pray today. God's people would lift their voices to Him. So what I'd like us to do uh, is just get in small groups of two or three people or so and pray together. Take a few minutes. Uh, you can pray for things that are going on in this world. You can pray for things going on in your life. Tell God how great He is. And take some moments to pray together and then when we start singing, you'll know to kind of wrap up, and we'll continue.
like the waters cover the seas. So as we go throughout our daily lives, we look to take God's glory with us for it to be shown anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's part of what I, I enjoyed so much last week. We had a baptism that was outside of a church building, just uh, at the beach next to the water. And we made a video of it for those of you who didn't get to be there in person. And for those who were, it's, it's good to be reminded that God is still at work today, moving people to, to commit to Him, to say that they'll give Him their life. And to say, yes, Jesus is Lord, and that we'll die to ourselves and live with Him. So, feel free to have a seat and uh, get to rejoice with us as we rejoice with those who have we're back.
the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in uh, bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. But really amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking uh, Galileans? Then how it is that each of them, each of us, hears them in, in his own native language? Parsons, Medes, and uh, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and uh, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the part of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what, to what I said. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, it, it is, this is what was spoken by the, great, by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God. I feel like we've said good morning several times, but it's just natural to want to say good morning. <laughs> But it's also really nice to know, yeah, this is definitely still morning, yeah. because we started so much earlier than usual. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew. I'm uh, the pastor here at Damascus Road. Okay, before, before I start the sermon, just to get it out there. So yesterday was my 11th anniversary. <laughs> We'll see if it actually fits with the sermon later. I just, I just wanted to say it because that's something that we celebrate around here is that uh, people who live out a uh, commitment to each other and stick with it. Uh, thank you for 11 years. <laughs> Today is Pentecost, as you've heard several times, and, and we had the reading just now about the beginning of, of it where the disciples were together and the Holy Spirit comes on them and then they, they're they speaking to this crowd and Peter stands up and he's preaching and telling people about how they can be saved, those who call upon the name of the Lord. And so we're going to look a bit more at the role of the Holy Spirit and over uh, probably the next few months we're going to talk about a theme of staying in step with the Spirit. We've been talking about having intimacy with God, and this is just zooming in on one part of what that is, continuing with this intimacy with God, but specifically through staying in step with the Spirit. Now, uh, the confidence that we have to approach God, to have any sort of intimacy with God, came through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And, and yet, there's this role that the Holy Spirit plays in us continuing to do that because the way that the Godhead works, the Trinity, which is these big theological terms of the idea of there's God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the three of those are God, three in one, co-equal, co-eternal, co-all these things. It 
but it's still mysterious of how exactly it works. But what I can say is this, the work that they do is like interlocking. It was never meant to be one completely without the other. The, the work of Jesus is meant to have the work of the Holy Spirit going along with it and, and vice versa, as well as, as the Father. So I'm not trying to neglect one for the other as we go through and as we talk about being in step with the Spirit. And I think today, hopefully, we'll see just how much the Holy Spirit works to keep us in that connectedness with the Father and the Son as well. So the roles are interlocking, um, but intimacy strongly comes because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so I wanted to just walk through some of the ways that the Holy Spirit brings us more towards intimacy with God the Father and with Jesus the Son, with, with the Holy Spirit itself, and also with each other. So intimacy with the Father, to start with, as, as Blaze prayed earlier, the Father is, is, is a giver and gives to us. Well-known verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Maybe less well-known, but still quite as important of a verse in Galatians 4, we're told that the Father gave his son, but then also we're told that he gave the spirit of his son into our hearts. So God the Father starts this whole giving idea by giving Jesus and by giving the Spirit to us. So the Father wants this to happen, whatever's going to come out of what Jesus and the Spirit do. And, and what, is, what do they do? Well, Ephesians 2.18 tells us that through Jesus we have access to God by one Spirit. So Jesus and the Spirit interlock, working together to give us access to God the Father. That was, that was the Father's intention, is he wanted this barrier that had been between humanity and him because of our own sin, because of our own, I know what to do better than you do, God, mentality. And so sent Jesus and the Spirit so that Jesus could live out this obedience that said, not my will but yours be done, fulfilling what humanity was meant to be in the first place. And then the Holy Spirit came to give us that same power living in us to be God's children the way we we're intended to. And it's the Spirit kind of fulfills what Jesus did because when we see Jesus and the way that he talked to his Heavenly Father, it, it, he uses that term Father a lot. If you think of the, the prayer Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. Jesus said, hey, you should pray in this way. And so often, as Jesus speaks about God, of all of these amazing names of God that there are, he chooses to use that term Father. Showing this intimacy, showing this relationship. And it wasn't that Jesus was the only one in the Bible. David used some reference to it as well. But, but at the time that, that Jesus was living, Father was not the most common use of a word when you're talking about God. Like, Jesus really connected to that. And then the Holy Spirit comes along. And what does the Holy Spirit do? We're told that the Holy Spirit is, is also the spirit of adoption by which we call out Abba, Father, Daddy. So the Holy Spirit helps us to become like Jesus. Uh, Jesus understood his relationship with God as, as this father and child, and, and the Holy Spirit helps us realize we have also that relationship with the Father. There's this intimacy we can have, a closeness, to call him Daddy. So the Holy Spirit gives us intimacy with the Father through, one, helping us understand that that's there, but that there's sort of the standing of the relationship, but also intimacy through gift-giving and understanding gifts. A lot of us, we give gifts to the people we love, right? And when you give a gift to someone that you don't care about, why do you do it? You know, I just don't do it. Like, I don't care, I'm not gonna give them a gift. Or I do it because I have to. But like, when we want to give a gift, it's because there's this, this connection so often. We don't go up and find random people to give 
gifts to very often. That's just not a normal human way of like, hmm, let's find someone who I don't know. We, we give gifts and, and, and share those because of a type of intimacy. The Father wants to give us gifts because he cares about us. Not because he doesn't. But how, how do we realize what those gifts are? How do we get that? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that's helping us understand that intimacy. 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul wrote it this way. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, no human mind has even conceived the things God has prepared for those who love Him. And these are the things that God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them. And in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given to us. The Holy Spirit has been given to his people so that we can understand what the gifts even are that he gave and why he gave them and how to use them. God's not the kind of giver that's like, hey, here's a gift, and like walks away and doesn't know or doesn't care what you did with it. Right? Like, those are the kind of gifts that you give to people you don't care about. It's like, hey, here's a gift. And then whether they re gift it, whatever. I did my job again. Well, like with my kids, if I give them a gift, I want them to use it. And I want it to be something that's useful to them. And the same is what our Heavenly Father has done. He's giving gifts that He wants us to be able to use. And so He gave us the Holy Spirit to help us in that process. And the Holy Spirit, is there not going to let us know sort of like these, all these gifts which are Gifts are often seen as an external thing, like, oh, I'm giving you a gift, but the Holy Spirit is also there to help us understand God's character and mind. As 1 Corinthians said, like, who, who really knows what's going on inside of a person? Except for, like, the person themselves, their own spirit knows. You can put on a good face, you can say lots of nice words, but who really knows what's going on inside? Well, your, your own spirit does. And... And the same is with God. We're told that, like, who knows what's going on inside of God? Well, God's Spirit does. And that is the same Spirit that we've been given. Not the Spirit of the world, but we've been given the Spirit that's from God. So, like, we're given, like, inside information into God's thoughts and hearts and feelings through His Spirit. And the Spirit's the one that's there to help us understand that, that gift of it. Another way that the Holy Spirit builds intimacy with the Father is the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And prayer is, is communication, it's talking. We're told in Romans 8 that like, the Spirit helps us in our weakness when we don't know how to pray. But the Spirit helps us to pray. Have you ever had trouble talking to your dad? And some people didn't. Uh, plenty of people did, though. And there were times where I didn't even know exactly what to say. Like my earthly father. I was like, I, like if I did something bad, yeah, I didn't want to go talk to dad first. It's like, what do I do with this? But also like for sometimes the emotional needs of like, I, I want to feel loved and I want him to feel proud of me, but I didn't know how to say that directly to him. And that's why I thank God for mom. Because at least in my life, my mom somewhat played that role. I'm like I, I could tell her things first, and then she could help me go talk to dad about it. Or sometimes she would talk to dad without me, which was also nice in moments. But like she played this role, this sort of like helping me to speak and, and would like stand beside me and sort of comfort me in the process. Even if in some of those moments I knew it was like, okay, I'm going to receive discipline for this, but it'll be nicer if mom's standing next to me. That was at least my experience of how I worked with my family. And I feel like, in a way, though it's a weak analogy, it's still this analogy that like, 
the Holy Spirit is there to sometimes walk beside us so that we can stand before God and say things that we don't know how to say, or that we're kind of concerned to say. I've, I've known so many people who've been like, I don't want to pray because I don't know what to say, or the whole like, I don't think God wants to talk to me because I know I haven't been living the way I should. Well, that's part of what the Holy Spirit is there for. Is, is yes, to convict us of those things and show us what the way we've been living isn't the right way, but also then to help us go talk to our Father about it and, and to clear the air and not keep up those walls or not try to stay behind a mask. The Holy Spirit is there to help us have intimacy with the Father. Next, the Holy Spirit helps us to have intimacy with, with the Son, with Jesus. Like, the Spirit is there to help keep the connection close. When Jesus was, was telling his disciples, hey, the, the Holy Spirit is, is going to be coming, and I know you don't all understand all what's going to be happening to you, but wait here for the Holy Spirit. It will come upon you. And, and Jesus, in these conversations, he says things like, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of everything that I've said. The Holy Spirit will teach you, will lead you into all truth. Well, if the Holy Spirit is leading us into truth, and if Jesus had said, I am the truth, then, I mean, if I take, like, the logical A plus B and B equals C, then A equals C kind of thing, like, the Holy Spirit is there to lead us into Jesus more, into the truth of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is, is there to help us understand Jesus better and remember what Jesus said and, and to keep bringing that up in our minds. The Holy Spirit keeps going, hey, Jesus, remember the one that, that loves you and that you loved? Remember your first love. The Holy Spirit is there to help us with that and, and to get us talking about Jesus. And we're told that Jesus said, you know that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. And there's various types of like spirit witness, spirit witness. They go together. <coughs> Having God's spirit and speaking about Jesus and, and the experiences that we've had with Jesus. They, they just go together. And talking about the ones we love is one of the ways that like, we continue intimacy with people. Right? Like, I told you guys it was my 11th anniversary because like... She's close to me. Like it's part of my life, and that's something I talk about it because it, it's meaningful to me. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us talk about Jesus because there's that relationship, there's there's that closeness that comes from continuing to talk about someone. We're also told that. Uh, in the first Corinthians, was first Corinthians, or is it Ephesians? Ephesians four. In one of Paul's writings, we are told. So it's just started with that, and it seemed you'd be like, he knows everything. I don't some days. In in Paul's writings, he says that we've been given like the the Holy Spirit in his first Corinthians, but he's saying that who knows God and except God's own Spirit within him, and we've been given God's Spirit. And we're told that we've been given the mind of Christ. And it seems like those kind of work together in that passage, where there's this parallel of having the Spirit to understand God is also having the mind of Christ. Like, we're given the same mind that Jesus had. Unimind kind of things. And the same Spirit that, that raised Jesus from the dead is the one that lives inside of us. So there's these similarities of like, this is what Jesus had to live with, and you get to have that too so that you can understand Jesus better. There's this intimacy that we get through Jesus, or through the Spirit with, with Jesus. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Um, there's, there's a common blessing that we say at the end of a lot of the services, or I'll say, that goes like this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. It's taken from 2 Corinthians 13. And the, this, the fellowship of the Spirit is the part I want us to consider. Like, fellowship. 
but togetherness. The fellowship doesn't get used a whole lot outside of church circles nowadays, unless you're talking about a J.R.R. Tolkien book. But the, the culture still understands fellowship being like, oh, there's, there's togetherness, there's this, oh, they're, they're a group, they're, they're fellows with each other. They've been shipped. I mean, they're... <laughs> The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an extrovert in like the true sense of the term of liking to be around people and gaining energy from that. When you read about the Holy Spirit, there's so much of working with people together, bringing people together, being around people. For those of you who are introverts, like I think Jesus was an introvert. So, like, I'm not saying, like, those are not both revealed in God, but that's its own, own thing. But, like, the Holy Spirit loves getting to be in and around people. And you're included with that. So the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is, is part of what the Spirit wants to do, is to have us, have us close with that. But also, it's, it's like, a, I think part of what the Holy Spirit will do is make us more like fellowshipping people. Because when we're told, like, may the grace of our Lord Jesus. It's not just like you having grace with Jesus, but it's Jesus giving, like, grace is this gift that comes from Jesus. Jesus is graceful, and we get that grace from him. And are, are meant to share that as well. And the love of the Father. Well, yes, there's supposed to be this love of the Father between us and the Father there, but it's also meant to be that kind of love. The Father's love is the one that you share. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit it's, yes, it's fellowship with the Holy Spirit, but it's also like the Holy Spirit's fellowshipping skills, nature, character, the, the, the fellowshipping that the Holy Spirit's able to do, may that also be in you to, to give. The Holy Spirit helps us to, to share in that sort of intimacy. Because the Holy Spirit is, is a person and has personhood. Sometimes the Holy Spirit seems really nebulous to us. And I admit, I, I've written a song that refers to the Holy Spirit like a cloud, and I think I mean, there's biblical reasoning for that, but sometimes we, we think of it like the cloud and it's very impersonal. Most people don't think like, I have a good relationship with a cloud. Right? Like, you look at a cloud and then a cloud just moves on. But the Holy Spirit is like a person that has this personhood. We're told emotions. We're told not, not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, that means the Holy Spirit can grieve, has, has sadness, has, has an emotion. And, and the Holy Spirit doesn't want to have grieving, which, which grieving comes naturally from a, like a disconnect, right? We grieve because something is lost. We grieve because someone is, is lost from us in, in some sort of sense. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to be disconnected, doesn't want us to be lost, but wants, wants us to be together. So there's, there's that sort of emotion. Also, the Holy Spirit is, is connected with joy so often when we read about the Holy Spirit. There's, there's joy in the Holy Spirit, or Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, joyfully said something, or the fruit of the Spirit includes joy. The Holy Spirit has, has good emotions too, not just sad ones. And, and has like a, a mind and, and can affirm things. One time some of the people that were later disciples of Jesus uh, were trying to make a decision on something. And they said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to make a certain decision. As though the Holy Spirit like, has a preference. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit agreed, confirmed, yeah, this is a good idea. Oh, a cloud has never confirmed something to me by saying, yeah, good idea, man. Right? Like, it's not just a, a wispy thing, but like a person does, a, a personality does. And so it's good for us to, to approach the Holy Spirit uh, as a person that we can have intimacy with. So we've seen us having intimacy with God, through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but also the Holy Spirit 
is here to give us intimacy with each other. The built family. 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 4 both talk about having the unity of the Spirit and being one body as people. Like the church, that's one of the pictures of what church is, is we're a body. And the Holy Spirit is, is there to have this unity of, of bodiness, where the body, all, all the separate pieces that, that have their separate work to do, but do it together. Philippians 2, we're told, like, if you have any, any fellowship with each other through the Holy Spirit, then, then be united. Have one mind. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Don't, don't try to be all separated and prideful. These sorts of things come along with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is there to try to bring us more and more into unity, more and more into being togetherness for the sake of building the church. And I, I love how the Holy Spirit working on us to make us united is again showing this interlinking of, of the Father and the Son. So Jesus, in John 17, as he was praying to his Father, prayed that we'd be one. And he's saying, I, I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and may you all be in me as I am in the Father, and may you all be united, and this will be the way that people know you're my disciples, the love that you have for one another, there's this, in, in John 13 to 17, some of my favorite chapters of the Bible, there's so much about unity, and, and Jesus is praying, may they be unified, may his people be unified, and then guess who's there to help out? The Holy Spirit is there to fulfill the prayer that Jesus was having with the Father. Father, Son, and Spirit working together towards His purpose of His people being that example of what true love, what true commitment to one another, what true covenant is like. And so, in, in Acts chapter 2, I haven't actually spoken a lot about Acts chapter 2 today, but in Acts chapter 2, there's this moment of, of Peter standing up in front of the crowd, and he starts speaking. He's like, you all don't understand what's going on. This isn't something crazy. They're not drunk. No, this is, this is the Holy Spirit that God has promised. And that leads naturally from talking about the Holy Spirit. He then leads directly into talking about Jesus. And saying, this Jesus whom so many of those people in that crowd had, had seen and been a part of, had known what had happened. Because 50 days earlier, Jesus had been crucified and resurrected in that weekend. So it's something that's like less than two months ago for so many people. And yes, there are the others that had come in from outside that did heard about this story because this was big news. You don't get to have an execution every day. And so Peter is saying, this Jesus, whom, whom the religious leaders and, and the Romans, they, they put to death, they crucified. But God had chosen him and, and had anointed him, and he had done miracles, and he had done these things. He had shown himself to be the Christ by the way he lived. Then he was crucified. But he has been resurrected, which, which fits totally in line with, with prophecies from our, our great King David from the past. That when he wrote these words about, you will not let your Holy One see decay, he wasn't talking about David, because David's still in his tomb. That was talking about Jesus, who is not dead, and is not in a tomb, but no, he is risen, and he is Lord. And so, Peter, talking about the Holy Spirit, very naturally, just, that leads to talking about Jesus. It must. And people, they're cut to the heart. They say, oh, well, uh, what are we... What are we supposed to do? What, what, what do we do with this information that the one who was meant to be the Messiah of our people, we killed off, but he's risen from the dead, so what now? And Peter says, well, repent, change, 
Change your mind, change your heart, change the way that you're living to come into line with, with Jesus and his truth. So repent and, and be, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And this promise is it's for you, it's for your children, it's for those who are far off. And 3,000 people that day off, like, accept that offer and say that, yes, that forgiveness of sins, I want that. That baptism of being immersed in, in something new, being immersed in, in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, I, I want that. that. Having his Holy Spirit, I want that. Yes. And 3,000 people joined that day. And then what do they do? We're told in Acts 2.42, well, they devote themselves to several things. One, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, which just so happens to be the Holy Spirit reminding them of what Jesus said and helping them to be witnesses. So that's, that's the Holy Spirit at work there. Okay? Um, devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Well... Told the Holy Spirit helps us with fellowship, so that makes perfect sense that the Holy Spirit is leading him into that. To prayer, well, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, so the Holy Spirit is there at work in that. Like these, these things that we're seeing this early church do are just outworkings of naturally the Holy Spirit at work in them. Of the apostles' teaching, fellowship, of prayer, and and what we're going to do actually in a moment, breaking of bread. We're not actually going to break apart a whole bunch of loaves of bread. Um, but this idea of communion. So I love that word communion. It's, it's a work off of that. So the word communion. Uh, I'm going to do one of those things that speakers do a lot. Let me give you the Oxford Dictionary definition of communion. The sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially on a mental or spiritual level. This is like a non-biblical, non-religious dictionary. It's just a regular old dictionary. It says, oh, this is what communion is. It's sharing, exchanging, intimate thoughts and feelings. And Jesus initiated communion. He was having this meal with his disciples. And it was, it was meant to be an intimate meal. He was sharing his thoughts, his feelings. They saw him go through various feelings in that night. And he told them his thoughts and tried to be speaking plainly. And they're like, you're speaking plainly now. Even though he was saying some things he had said in the past. It's just the exact same way. But it, it was... This, this intimate meal, sharing with them and encouraging them to share with one another. And so when the Holy Spirit came, I'm God's people. And so they started doing these things like fellowship and, and prayer and, and listening to this witness of who Jesus was. It was very natural for them to also include this, this meal of taking bread, taking the, the fruit of the vine. And, and eating and drinking and remembering Jesus. His death. Because Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body that's, that's broken for you. And he told them that the night before he was crucified. They saw the next day what that looked like for his body to be broken. I mean, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And he said that the night before. He ended up being crucified and they saw clearly what that meant for his blood to be poured out. He used those things as a reminder so that when they were going to sit down and have bread again, they'd be like, oh, Jesus died. Well, it wasn't meant to push them away and be this, like, gory picture of, like, oh, I never want to eat bread again, because it has this bad connotation. Instead, it's meant to show love. 
It was meant to bring connection. It was meant to go, wow, Jesus did this for me, and Jesus did this for us. Not just me, but the person sitting next to me. He shared this meal. And those disciples, if they sat around and thought, each person at that table that night, they knew each other's faults. That guy, I don't trust him with money. That guy is a hothead that wants to call down fire on people. That guy tried to start a revolution. That guy's kind of a coward. That guy turned on his own people. Like, they knew each other well enough to know their faults. And to know that despite those faults, Jesus still gave himself for each one of them. And so when we come to take communion, we remember Jesus. We remember the work of his Holy Spirit that reminds us of Jesus and binds us together. That makes this an intimate sharing of thoughts and feelings, especially on, on a mental and spiritual level. I guess my question is, what, what, will, you, what will you share when you do that? As you take part in communion, what, what is it that you share of you? How do you commune with God the Father? And with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit, and with the others around you that are part of the family of God. Sadly, church has many times been a way for people to like hide themselves from things, and hide themselves from like you go on, you put on a face, put on a mask, pretend like it's all okay, and you try not to share much if you can. The idea is that we're supposed to be able to to share the good gifts that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, to encourage one another, build one another up, to carry one another's burdens, to love as brothers and sisters. So I want to take first just a, a few moments to pray uh, and then we'll have a, a song as kind of we prepare ourselves to take communion together. But to consider, what is it that, that you have to share? What is it that God has given you through His Spirit to share with those around you? To live that way. And, and what are the things you need to share with God? Maybe that starts with the conversation of sharing uh, God, here are the things that I need you to fix in my life because I'm broken. Here are the things that I need forgiveness of. Just like Peter had said on Pentecost Day, repent for the forgiveness of your sins. When you, when you come to God and share with Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us when we're honest with Him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit so that we can even feel that connection to call you Father. So I come to you as your child. And we, as, as a church, come as your children. Thank you for all the attention and care that you give us. Thank you for the many good gifts. Thank you for wanting to let us know your heart and mind. Forgive us for the ways that we try to live our own way instead of trusting your way. I pray that we would live with the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can go live the way that you did call us to. That we can show that to the others around us. And hopefully by the way that we show that, by the way that we live it with each other, for that to be clear to them that you are God and that you exist. And that you want them to join too. Turn our hearts back to you. Each, each day that we wake up anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So yeah, the band would come up. Uh, the way that we'll sort of practically do communion is there are some cups on the back table that have it's like two different seals that you can pull off. The first one has the little kind of wafer in it. It's a picture of the bread, and then the second one is is the cup. Um, but as we sing the song, feel free to go back and and get one of the cups, and then come back to your seat. Um, and then we'll, after the song, sort of all take it together. Um, communion is for people who have said, yes, I'll follow this, and I'll accept his offer. Um, for us, the, it doesn't matter what denomination of Christianity you're a part of, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. But what we do say, like, this is about intimacy with God, and if you don't have that, if, if you don't follow Jesus and you're like, no, that's not my thing, let me just ask you, please don't take communion, because this is an intimate thing. But for anyone who says, yes, this, this is mine, I, uh, I have given Jesus my life, he's my Lord and Savior, this is, you're welcome. I'd love to have you join with us, because you are a brother and sister in Christ, now, through God's Spirit. Yeah? So, during, during the song, it's a couple minutes long, so you don't all have to rush, but during the song you can go grab one of the cups, and then after the song we'll take that together. Spirit of conviction, root out sin within us, till there's no competition.
He took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Let's take it. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the blood of my hand of the new covenant. Pour it out for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
interview. I was like, in the interview, guys, I was, I didn't even, I didn't even really like prepare, or I wasn't. I had so much peace, but it's like I was walking, and you know, we're talking about letting shine. You're out there shining, but you're not really shining on your own. It's like you have a whole army shining with me. Like I have a whole army that got me, and that's the reason I was shining. So, thank you guys very much for your prayers and standing with me and being with me. And I am strong because we are. <laughs> thank you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you go with the love of the Heavenly Father and with the fellowship of the Spirit, helping you to have intimacy with all of who God is and fellowship with those around you. May you have a blessed Sunday. May you go in peace. We'll see you next week, not here, but at the uh, Riverside for another baptism.